This is about me. As I've just said, I'm a, I'm a former nurse. Um, was an NHS career manager. Then went into pharma in the mid 90s. I spent 10 years in market access. Went back to the NHS. Worked in the big PCT as a director. Set up Blue River Consulting. Um, it's not an advert of Blue River. All of our consultants, everything we do is in the NHS. Okay, so all the associates who work with me are NHS employees. Half of my time, I am the chief executive of Washington Community Healthcare. What is Washington Community Healthcare? It's the GP Federation, which James was very helpfully alluding to. We're part of a Vanguard site, an MCP. Throughout my presentations, I'm going to use NHS acronyms and I'm going to rattle through I don't want to delay us. I'll be here this afternoon with all the group discussions, but I'm going to use those acronyms. And uh, I know I'm not his friends, but I really want to challenge you guys. Uh, one of the issues at the moment is your teams, the people who come and see me. I saw two of them yesterday. Um, HDMs, key account managers, those kind of people. They're not up to date on the language, and they're not up to date on what's going on. Okay? So they'll come and see me and say, I want to talk to you because there are good things about Washington Community Healthcare. I'll go, okay. And uh, they don't know what a Vanguard is, they don't know what an MCP is, and they don't actually know what Washington Community Healthcare is. Okay? That's the sad reality. Honourable exceptions, but so. Um, I've been involved in commissioning since it started. Like James, I go back to the fund building days in 91. And um, I was, um, as part of the river arrangement, I took um, a CCG, what became Newcastle West CCG, through to the day of authorisation and I left. The reason I left is because I knew what was going to happen. And I knew it wasn't an era for people like me and James. Yeah? But that time will come back. Recently as part of the Vanguard stuff, the Vanguard team, Sam Jones, they come around around the country, visit all the sites. Lots of highly paid people in the, in the room. What they're searching for is somebody who can do something. Someone who can change something, something who can build something. They're very few and far between. And without being a modest, that's, I'm not saying I'm that kind of person, but the kind of people who work with me are. So there are questions, there are some excellent questions just before the break. So are GP still up for this? Commissioners sitting at meetings? No, they're not. Yeah? Somebody saying, we've got 50 grand. What would you want? Do you want a CPM? Do you want a physio? Do you want a bit of phlebotomy? Uh, should we work with some other practices, develop some ultrasound? They're up for that. Okay? So real commissioning, real changes, real design of services, definitely. This is a map of the NHS. And co-commissioning. This is one of the things about language. And when you're out in the real NHS, and unashamedly, I guess that's where I come from, that's why Willard's asked me to do this stuff, rather than the strategic things that I don't really know much about. It's the real hands-on stuff, that's what I'm in bed with it. NHS people do not recognise the term co-commissioning as relating to specialised commissioning. Okay? What they relate it to is this. The important part of the legislation was saying that commissioning would come down NHS England, CCGs, into the mass of the providers. What we're now saying, as James has really eloquently expressed, is this bizarre position that a platform, the main pillar of the legislation, has now been totally disregarded. So NHS England is going to go to a more great role now. Why? Because it's a shambles. It's completely dysfunctional and not fit for purpose. That is why. That's why it's happening. They cannot do their job. They can't do specialised commissioning, and they couldn't commission primary care either. So it didn't matter whether you were talking about practice nurse training or whether you're going to build an extension on Dr. Gloss's surgery, or whether you're talking about strategic stuff, about conditions that affect one in a million people, they couldn't do either. So they bung them down to CCGs. And an important point that even your guys who are well trained and get this don't realise is CCGs who take on co-commissioning, what the NHS calls co-commissioning, which is that of primary care, receive no additional resources whatsoever for doing it. Not one penny, not one post. Okay? So they're taking on an enormous challenge. The reason they're doing it is because the managers who are in them desire that power. And I'll come back to it. To understand the NHS, you have to stand there, understand the dynamics of the people in it. In the same way as your world, and you build a career, NHS people have their own ways of doing it. So what co-commissioning means in the NHS, we can come back to specialised commissioning, not shying away from that, but what I'm going to be talking about is that. CCGs now are actually the commissioners of primary care. 
And that was an absolute tenet of the legislation is that would not happen. And as James said, GPs from day one, and people like me could see it coming and will start to move away, but those who remain in, this has really destroyed their confidence. How is it a member organisation when you're now performance managed by your colleagues? People you play squash with. Simple summary, in case you're going to fall asleep. And what I'm delighted with this, I haven't seen James for a couple of years and seen him present, as I said, it's been far too long because that kind of speaks a lot of sense, is how similar what I'm saying is. Right? This is, we have not planned this. The Lansley reforms have been turned back without the legislation changing. CCGs are essentially PCTs, reinforced because PCTs didn't commission primary care, they couldn't control that. But CCGs can. And actually, I'm bit, I disagree with James. He said, well, at least CCGs don't have provider arms. In the vanguards they do. That is what they're actually aspiring to do. To develop and bring in the community nurses. And in fact, more than that, social care. And all kinds of people. Housing. Yeah? So the, the, the um, uh, federation I work with, we're part of the vanguard. We're in Sunderland, Friday morning. I've been asked to see the director of housing for Sunderland <coughs> Council. Yeah, it's about 40% of all the houses in Sunderland are council houses. So he's asked to see me, and that's what it's about. <coughs> this is what we've got. I'm sorry about the greyness on the slides, it's a lot better on my laptop. Is change by euphemism and stealth is the NHS way. It's not the legislation, it's not the strategy. And interestingly, the House of Journalism on top of this, things are happening and they're commenting about it afterwards. It's very, very, very interesting. This is my local CCG, North Tyneside, it's a fairly typical CCG, 215,000, it's a bit on there, a bit smaller than average. That's the budget at the moment before co-commissioning. And if you see where the money goes, this is actually last year's uh, figures, the year that's just ended, that's, that's where the money goes. And one of the things it shows is the charade of commissioning. It's an absolute charade. What have we got on there? 59% of the budget goes straight into the acute hospital. In the North East of England, all the Foundation Trust, and every trust is a Foundation Trust, has integrated care, community, the bottom left there. They also own that. My two local Foundation Trusts also have GP practices, and own those. They're completely vertically integrated. So basically what you're saying on here is North Tide CCG gets 284 million, but 70% of that goes bing, bing, straight out into the Foundation Trust. You've got all the transactions of PBR, all the nonsense around it, the pretend of contract negotiations and all this, it's a game. The money goes big, big, big to the real NHS because they have to pay doctors and nurses and physios. Okay? It's, it's an absolute charade. But that's the kind of figures that we've got at the moment. Now interestingly, you've got next door to that is Newcastle. Newcastle hospitals spends a billion pounds a year, three million pounds a day. 60% of their income comes from specialised commissioning. So what's the role of the CCG? What's the role of the 20 CCGs who all buy a bit of their services? Okay. The hospital, that hospital is the leader of the NHS and sets a strategy. If they build a new children's hospital, that happens. It's not a commissioning decision. Okay. As you will have noticed on that, 0.3% of that has the word primary care in Primary care and health services. But pose this question. So Sunderland is a level 3 co-commissioner. It's one of the 64 that have gone that way. So Sunderland's now will look different. Sunderland's rectangles and bubbles. But does anybody know what that figure is? So if you're adding primary care into that algorithm, the cost of running all the GP practices, the practice nurses, all the energy that is behind someone like James and his practice, what percentage is it? Do you know? I'll tell you now, you guys don't know either when they come out and talk about it. I'll come to talk to you about co-commissioning. If you really, that's great. Let's talk about it. But they don't know the basic facts. About 6%? That's all it is. Okay, an easy way to remember it is the cost of primary care is about half the cost of primary care medicines. Which is why pharmacists drive better cars than GPs. Okay, sometimes. 
One of the takeaway messages from this that I think you ought to be optimistic, I'm challenging you about, but I'm doing it as a friend. One of the things that your guys need to understand is when you've got co-commissioning in primary care, I think this bubble's going to increase. So if you look at some of the catalysts and flexibility that's around, um, I don't think there's no one here from MSD, is there? Well, I'll use them as an example. Um, MSD have an excellent project, uh, pro, uh, product of Nexplon. It's the contraceptive that a woman has embedded in her upper arm. Okay? The whole arrangements for that are in enhanced services. So MSD's market in future depends on that bubble and how that goes. But I think that bubble's going to increase significantly. And part of your frustration about how you get change and how you get service change, how you get funding, how you open doors, how do you break through procurement and formal systems, that bubble is an opportunity for you. Because that could fund new diagnostics, changes in behaviour, nurses doing different things, someone like James's level saying, I'm going to devolve this to a healthcare assistant, it's much more effective, but how do we pay for that? Enhanced services are a glue, and you can treble that budget and it's still only 1% of the budget. Okay? I'll come back to that. So what's going on? This is the thing, it's not so much, again, James was spot on. Don't worry about the structure so much. Obviously you're trying to find out what is going to happen, but try and find out why. And this is um, part of the things that are going around. I've been around 35 years, I bet that's longer than anybody else in the room. I, I bet it is looking at how young and healthy you all look. Um, I've never known a time when it's been like this. Every sector of healthcare is now under conjoined pressure. There is now an understanding. You cannot have a situation where the local foundation trust, the ambulance trust, the mental health trust are underspent, overspent, whatever, and the CCG is in a different position. There is only one health pound in Birmingham, in Kingston, in Torquay, whatever. There is one pound, and it's the way that that is spent. It's conjoined issues. All the policies about integration, it's a magic word, collaboration, innovation, but nobody knows how to do it. CCGs are looking to have control of all aspects of the health service. What this is uh, the illusion that everyone's chasing. The public, bless them, are finally waking up to the reality. What they thought is in every health economy there was an air traffic control and the NHS sorts everything out. The reality of it, as you know, is a lot different. It's a fragmented, dislocated, ineffective service where the transactions between those services sometimes end up with people dying. Okay, this is the, the scandal of the NHS. I worked in a CCG, ran a CCG, um, 35 practices. Four different computer systems that didn't talk to each other. Absolute nonsense. Okay? So CCGs rightly, well, somebody, the NHS is trying to take control of that system. CCGs are pushing themselves in that space in many areas, but they're not ready to do it. Could have added a lot more pictures and things up here. Here's the NHS, okay? Absolutely hilariously, isn't it? I'm sure you go through this. You'll have a colleague come in from the States. I sometimes still, people bring people up from the States and they come up and they spend a day with me in Newcastle and some of them, we take them out and show them the NHS. And the first thing they say is, it must be amazing to be in a country where everything's in one organisation, everything's seamless, yeah? And then they come and see it. Because the reality is, apologies for the colours on this, what's supposed to happen here is the lady over there, the care of the patient, so the only things that stay in colour. The only people who really know the whole experience of the system are them. It's the patients and the carers, it's the users of the service. Yeah? This is the stunning fact. Most managers in CCGs do not understand primary care. Most managers in CCGs do not go into primary care practices. They do not understand the minutiae of primary care. They come through a hospital route. They come a different route. So as I found myself yesterday, deliberately, mischievously catching out someone's CCG. I knew it wasn't a rhetorical question, I did it for embarrassment, so it's a bit childish really. But I said, so how many patients a day does the GP see? And they didn't know. I'll ask you, how many urban, James is in the Wirral, I'm working in Newcastle Assembly, a GP in a typical working day, how many patients will they have a contact with? There's a lady on GP on the radio, she said she's on 49 in a day. That's, that's, that's not many. 
typically 75, 80. You might see 40, 50 face to face. Okay? Now the point we were at a meeting, we talked about diagnostic services and things like that, and the importance of technology. I say, so you see somebody at 8 o'clock, you're busy, you write down a scrap of paper, or you write down on your phone, you're going to check Mr. Phil's bloods, first time you get a chance. That might be 6 o'clock at night. You've had contact with 80 patients in between. Okay? But the significant thing is that's the director of commissioning and they didn't know how to calibrate that in their head. Not even to say how many hours they worked, six patients an hour, some home visits, a bit of lunch, a few emails. Yeah? But very, very interesting. Okay. So one of the points I want to point to with that is the older I get, the more I see tipping points gone. I can remember, oh, 15 years ago, going to Marks and Spencer's, and uh, my wife did something, I thought, I've gone to Marks and Spencer's, their browser were I thought, hang on a minute, there's nothing in here that's fashionable enough for me to buy. And I'm a middle-aged, conservative guy. But this is all too staid for me. You know, you think what's happened to Marks and Spencer's. There is a tipping point gone in primary care. The demand, the capacity, that's customers last stand up there. That's what it looks like. The demand is absolutely inexorable. Okay? Premises, how do GPs get the investment at the moment to improve their premises? It's virtually impossible. The IT's all over the place. There's quality variation, they've got the CQC on their back. Quite rightly in some instances, some of the quality is deficient. Workforce, last year, James said amazing, a fantastic thing. It should be the NHS um, model. The law of unintended consequences. Okay? So last year, as well, the mid staffs, they beef up all the requirement for acute hospitals, nursing, staff, and ratios. Great. So what did they do? They pinched good practice nurses out of practices. Okay? You look around practices, you look around the hospital canteen, the nurses are my age. Workforce, <coughs> skills. Have we got the right kind of skills in the right place at the right time? No, we haven't. Size. This is the point that I'm saying that we're going to move to. And this is my personal opinion, so I could be wrong. We are going to move to super practices, 35 to 50,000 population. If you're not in a practice that size, or a group of practices that can work together to create a de facto organisation of that size, you are finished. I shared a platform with the Chief Executive from Manchester from the CCG. When I said that, he then presented, someone asked him a question, and he said, the only way I disagree with David, David said five to ten years, I would say within three years. But that's because I'm in an inner city area. Okay? And this is one of the reasons you get the federations and networks. There are two kinds of federations and networks. One sort of federation are groups of GPs who come together because they want to keep everything the same and they want to keep traditional general practice. They're finished. The federations that are going to be successful are those who come together to say that change is inevitable and federating and working, that is the way we're going to manage our way through inevitable change. And so that bit is a very personal opinion, and I do know that could be wrong. But when you look at those things, of the 209 CCGs, 64 are level 3 commissioners that put the 1st of April. How many of them wanted to be in level 3? I bet it was 209. Because there was a real tic tac coming down from NHS England that you must do this. The telling thing is, legally there's still membership bodies and they have it voted by the practices. What it actually tells you is there's only 64 CCGs out of the 209 who could deliver that vote. That's what it really means. They all have to become commissioners because NHS England can't do it and they have to chuck out the responsibility. But how many CCGs do we know that can deal with those issues that have got a plan about it? So the crazy thing in my little world in the North East one of their responses is to start GP career start. This is subsidising funded places for young GPs. And now they're all competing with each other for the same limited pool. Nobody's looking at how you get young doctors to come into primary care or how you look at different workforce. They're all competing with each other to try and recruit people. A race to the bottom. So have we got a really clear policy direction? We have think we have, it purports to be. It's about integration, health and social care coming together. Yeah, we've got to stop the tap on unplanned admissions. We've got to be proactive with the most vulnerable groups of patients and understand that. We've got to move upstream. You have phrases like we've got to use smoke alarms, not fire engines. Yeah, we need self-care. But 
I've been hearing that for 35 years, it's rhetoric. Where's the actual plans, where does the examples? How do we get from here to where we want to be? Because the reality at the moment is, in inner city areas, for the first time ever since 1948, as I understand it, is mortality is getting worse. So life expectancy is getting worse. But I don't think we really know what here and there looks like. The five-year view, as James said, is very much Simon Stevens' personal view. I think it's a very attractive view. But where are the people who are going to get us from one place to another? How are we going to actually deliver some of those concepts? So what they stepped it in is the Vanguard sites, as James was saying. I'm part of a multi-specialty community provider. It's 14 of those. Nine packs. As James was saying, again, there's some around social care. Okay? All of this happened at the same time as Cook commissioning was sorted out. But the interesting thing about these new models of care, those models of care and the lexicon that creates them wasn't known until Christmas. March the 9th, they were announced. If you get the plans for any uh, vanguard and hold it up to the light, there's not a lot of detail in there. You won't find gap sharp, lots of fluffy descriptions, okay? But there's also some scary stuff. So in Sunderland, first line, from April 2016, we will have outcome-based contracts. That means no PBR. What does that actually mean in reality? What is the risk that's been calculated for that? Okay. What's the big issue that the Northern CCGs, and I'll get into party political stuff, but the Northern CCGs, what they now face, is a massive transfer of funding southwards through the funding formula, which is very, very important for farmers. Yeah? Particularly if you work in a company that sells stuff around good old long-term conditions. Big, big changes. That's my thought, that what all of this points to is the end of independent primary care. Yeah, that, uh, if you're old enough at my age, the Dr. Finley model. I, I was actually delivered by my GP at home. You know? So, you know, that's how old there. James mentioned about Greater Manchester. This is something that Pharma collectively does not know enough about and didn't see coming, which is extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. This is very, very interesting. I'll mention this one thing in case we want to talk about Greater Manchester and the devolution, but also because of this slide. It is a really interesting slide. Again, it supports what Jane's saying. Mm -hmm. These are the different population areas. Yeah? What matters <coughs> and what changes and what will deliver the change that quick, we don't call it that anymore, needs to do is down in. It is absolutely absurd when they created CCGs and they say, right, the CCGs across Birmingham and I'm going to look at urgent emergency care. You need to do that at one, two million population. You need to sit down with the ambulance and the foundation trust, the big acute trust and sort it out. And then I've heard the relevance of the NHS joining in. But what will make a difference on the ground, particularly to why people get readmitted, is who have we got who's doing spirometry? What happens at half past eight? What happens if you can't speak English? Yeah. And some proper segmented analysis and then a response to it. Again, in inner city areas, never tired for this, up to 40% of all attendances in A&E are children under five. But you hear it being uh, discussed on even a, a sensible programme like Radio 4 today, and they start talking about drugs, or they talk about accidents or getting GP appointments. But it's a different kind of issue. That is the focus, and that's the bit I'm interested in. That sub-50,000, that neighbourhood approach. Because this is, uh, if you've seen me present these before, I'm not going to apologise, I'll write through quickly. But this is just coming back to remind ourselves of what the challenge is. And where you can make the difference. Big strategic stuff, like in Manchester. Manchester's got the same population of Wales. You can do that great big, global, great big conurbation wide, but then you need to do stuff at a different level, and you need to say, what is the right bit at a neighbourhood level? What is the kind of borough level? What is the conurbation? This is Newcastle. 32% of the people in Newcastle go to a &E every year. 43% have an outpatient appointment, and 12% have an emergency admission to hospital. That excludes mental health, it excludes maternity, and it excludes planned care. Okay? So just let that sink in. 32, 43, 12. They aren't the worst figures in the country. But that is why we've got a fiscal cliff. Some of the solving of that 
is big global levels. Look at some of the successes we've had with things like 111, for example, strategic commissioning. No. What will make a difference is stuff that's a local level. It's groups of GPs saying, you know what? When you look at that, it's an awful lot of that alcohol driven, people with personality disorders, the same families. We could have a certain care worker to go in and do that proactively. I saw a patient the other day. That's what I remember in fund building. That's what I remember in PBC. As soon as PBC became CCGs, we lost that energy. Okay, we lost that flexibility. Again, these are Newcastle figures that were similar in any urban area in the country. Over half of all the emergency admissions go home the same day and the next day. The average cost is £1,900. What's NHS funding? £1,200 a head. Okay? One person has a COPD exacerbation, can't use their inhaler, calls an ambulance, goes in overnight, you've blown their entire NHS budget for the year, plus a chunk of someone else's. That is the reality of it. Can't see that very well, but you can see that is a um, typical inner city practice with its A&E attendances mapped out against uh, a 24-hour uh, spell for a year. Um, one of the facets that, you know, I'm not trying to be Mr. Smart on us, how few CCGs ever look at data in this way? When you look at it like that, what you see is the peaks are between 11 o'clock and 2 o'clock during the week. Monday's the busiest day, Tuesday's is the next busiest day. What kind of patients are going there? All those bars in England are moving further and further over the right. Patients are moving so their use of emergency services and urgent care is getting later and later in the day. All kinds of reasons for that. Yeah? Ethnicity, the way that people live their life. When I go to work, I'm an early bird, I go past a huge business park, 29,000 people work on it, huge call centres. I drive past about 6 o'clock in the morning and you see the night shift coming off. These are the new proletarians. A night shift to call centres. Hundreds of people walking down the road. Okay? This is in Newcastle. So when do they use NHS services? When does a taxi driver use them? But this is the one. This is my local deanery last year. Okay? They could only fill a third of the posts on their GP training scheme. And if you talk to GPs privately, they have to affect the quality to achieve that third. Okay? So they're, they're taking people on they wouldn't have done in the past. Okay, so finally, very quickly, things that I think will happen, PACS is very interesting. Um, we've got a vacuum, we've got a new burning platform, any imagery you want to give. People are racing forward to fill that gap and fill the integration. The most powerful foundation trusts are going to expand. Earlier on we heard about hospitals closing, hospital chains, the Shelford group, again collectively, I see some of you nodding, some of you not. Just put it into Google, this is an extremely important organisation. There's only about 12 hospitals in it. They control nearly 10% of the expenditure of the NHS in England. It's a very, very powerful group. Primary care is heading for unprecedented change. And I'm not prone to hyperbole, I promise you. It is completely unprecedented. The rate of change and the difference that primary care is going to have to go through. As James was saying, CCGs are essentially PCTs, but turbocharged, but with less ability to actually deliver anything, you know, sadly and totally inward looking in a crap culture. Um, significant local variation in the way that the NHS works, things like PBR. So already, my local hospital, which is about half a mile away from me, works in one PBR regime. We go to the trust next door, works in another PBR regime. CCG next door is totally gain share contracts. You've got the next CCG, which will be Sunderland. They've got outcome-based contracts for next April. What does that mean? They don't know. Okay? More conurbations will go for devolution, <coughs> staying away from party politicals. This is a massive outcome from last week's result. Okay? And then, staying out of party politicals. I live in the northeast of England. All the Labour um, MPs increased their majority. The councils will move them further to Labour. There's very interesting the next day. This is the D word. It's what everyone's mentioning. So what's happening in Manchester, you see Leeds Bradford, Hull, Sheffield, Rotherham, and Barnsley, the northeast of England. There's all kinds of variants that are going to come out with people expressing interest in this. 
Okay. Again, okay. coming back to very personal stuff, and I absolutely missed my last remarks. What we need to do to do it to stay brave. Brave, bold, absolutely delighted. I didn't know about changing this anecdote until I was here and heard it. But it's absolutely fantastic. Hopefully, it is exactly what I'm saying here. What we're going to have is some freedom out there in the NHS to get away from risk adverse process led control pseudo management. That is, the kind of people you've never seen in the CCG, they look like they're on the apprentice, they've got all their, they've got an iPad, they've got four phones, they're, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry I'm late, I've uh, been in a really important meeting, you know. They've got all the panoply of management without their CV. Let's have the energy and creativity that we've had at points before. Crying out for this. I've seen this happen before. Director of commissioning back in uh, an old health authority. I made a little bit of money one year. And got local GPs together and he gave them 250 pounds each and said you can spend it on anything you like. There are still things, oh, it must be 15, 20 years ago, there are still fantastic things locally to where I live that all come about from what? When that happened. The final thing, apart from, let's say, a typical CCG's got a budget for a million. James was talking about devolving a kind of like a modern version of fund building. I'd say even if you gave out a tenth of one percent, so you got five, six practices together, you gave them 300 grand and let them spend it on anything they like. It will work as long as you do the last thing that I've got on there, which is this has devastated really good people that run into CCGs and trying to make a difference. And that's to create some kind of free trade zone where you don't have to make the AQP. You don't have to spend two years going around OG procurement to come out with something rubbish. You can actually go to a hospital and ambulance trust social care and say, if we bought you 60 grand, could you create a workout for our you recruitment? If we sort out the premises, you could do that. And to allow us to blitz through that. Okay? Just to finally finish on one little anecdote of that, my, the moment when I decided to leave the CCG and not be part of it, we were looking to do more about vasectomies at the hospital. We went down to a place um, which looked perfect to do it, and I stood there with someone from NHS Propco. These are the people who own the NHS estate. Yeah? It's a true fact. The NHS has got more empty space in buildings than Tesco's has occupied. James talks about the waste. NHS people pay too much. Okay? That's one thing people don't like to talk about. Have too many perks, and the use of premises is scandalous. Anyway, stand there with NHS Propco, clinical director for neurology, lead GP. All sorted, Propco person says, hang on a minute, how many toilets are there? There's one toilet, in, yeah? You need to talk to two toilets. Well, we're doing for secondaries. Oh no, you've got gender specific toilets, you can't do it. Right, and that's, yeah, I promise you, we tried everything we could, but you cannot get past the power of the clipboard. You cannot do it. That's me finished. Thanks very much for your patience. Thank you.